Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Mike Keim, as he said. Uh, I have been practicing here in town for 30, going on 39 years now. Um, and I probably will be for another 39 years, according <laughs> to my wife. Uh, she says I'll stop practicing after she plants the flowers on top of the six feet above me. So uh, I'm sure that I enjoy what I do, and so I plan on continuing to practice because I enjoy it. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about senior dental care and um, first off I think I probably want to say that senior dental care and regular dental care are not that much different. Um, basically if a senior gets a cavity they get a filling. If a senior needs a tooth extracted they get extracted the same way someone who isn't a senior. Um, there are some differences that show up as individuals age that contribute to some of the problems that seniors can have that a younger individual usually doesn't. Um, first off, of course, a lot of seniors have uh, very involved medical histories, uh, whereas a younger individual may not. Um, and sometimes those complicate treatment and will dictate changes in the way the dentist is going to treat the individual, either in the selection of the anesthetic that they're going to use or the length of appointment times, um, things like that. Um, one of the other things that uh, seniors have that happens to them that um, can cause them some problems is uh, dry mouth. And a lot of the dry mouth that seniors have is due to medications that they're on. Uh, high blood pressure medications in particular are notorious for causing dry mouth. But your saliva is very important in protecting your teeth. It, it helps wash bacteria away from the teeth. It contains calcium which helps to remineralize your teeth uh, from the effects of the bacteria on the teeth. Uh, so when your saliva flow rate drops, then quite often you'll have more cavities. Um, I have had uh, patients who uh, had chemotherapy and radiation therapy for cancer treatments and some of the fastest growing cells in your body are your saliva glands and those are the cells that are most affected by um, cancer treatment, chemotherapy in particular and those individuals are very susceptible to um, extreme amounts of decay in a very short period of time because they have no saliva and they will tend to, I had one patient who was a rancher and he would go out and take a uh, two or three rolls of lifesavers in his pocket and suck on them all day because his mouth was dry. Well, when you add sugar into uh, a lack of saliva, you're really going to have problems. And um, he came in six months after he had been in for his last checkup and all of a sudden he had massive decay around every tooth in his mouth. He was making a very poor choice with the lifesavers for something to keep his saliva going. Um, one of the best choices is a sugarless gum. Uh, sugarless gum will stimulate your saliva flow and help uh, clean things off of your teeth. Now, Notice I said sugarless, not sugar gum. How about a rock? <laughs> a rock is the old camper's trick, and that works. But um, the rocks in the mouth sometimes tend to lead to broken teeth. <laughs> so uh, sometimes you're better off with uh, the sugarless gum. Um, that's what I personally chew a lot of. I buy it by the, the case almost. 
But, uh, Doctor, isn't uh, chewing gum hard on the enamel? Chewing gum is a sugarless gum, which most sugarless gums, if you chewed them, they don't get really hard like the sugared gums do when you chew them. Uh, juicy fruit, boy, after you've been chewing it for a half hour, you really got to bite into it to get through it, whereas sugarless gum stays a little softer. But uh, your teeth are designed with uh, uh, the largest amount of enamel on your biting surfaces, and they can pretty well handle it. Uh, now, uh, biting hard uh, can lead to broken or cracked teeth, but uh, normally, if a tooth does not have a filling in it, it's not very susceptible to breakage, and other than in an accident or a fight or something like that. Thank uh, you. Now, once you start putting fillings in teeth, fillings weaken the teeth, um, but the cavity that was already there weakened the tooth to start with. Uh, and putting fillings in tend to uh, basically fill whole uh, with some exceptions. If you put a silver filling in, it basically just fills the hole. If you put a, a tooth colored filling in, the tooth colored filling can restore some of the strength back to the tooth because it is bonded to the tooth. Um, a porcelain, bonded porcelain restoration can also restore strength back to the tooth. Uh, a bonded porcelain restoration, the research shows that it can restore anywhere from 100 to 110 percent of the strength back to the tooth because the porcelain is actually harder than your own tooth is. Now gold can also restore strength back to the tooth if you put a crown on the tooth uh, or a non-lay on the tooth, something like that. Um, now one of the other things that can happen to seniors that can lead to more cavities is uh, a loss of gum tissue height. Um, if you um, don't take adequate care of your teeth, you tend to lose a little of the bone that supports the teeth. And as you lose the bone height, then the gum tissue height will recede. And then you start exposing root surfaces in your mouth um, instead of just the enamel on the crown of the tooth or the top of the tooth. And root surfaces are much more susceptible to decay than the enamel is. It doesn't have the enamel to protect it and so you can get a cavity very quickly. So a couple of the things that tend to lead towards more decay in seniors are the, the loss of saliva uh, and the uh, loss of gum tissue height. Now, um, we can replace and restore um, teeth in lots of different ways anymore. One of the ways that has become more and more common lately is with an implant. Uh, if you have a tooth that needs to be extracted for one reason or another, it can be replaced with an implant. It can sometimes be replaced with a fixed bridge or it can be replaced with a removable appliance. Now, removable appliances vary all the way from uh, one tooth that uh, uh, it fits over the teeth next to it and it replaces both of them up to a full denture or what most people refer to as a plate, uh, which uh, replaces all of the teeth on one arch. Uh, you know, partials can replace anywhere from one clear up to, to 10 or 12 teeth on, on an arch, but once there are no teeth left, then basically you have to go to a denture. A lot of seniors, it used to be, every time you got to be about 40, all, everybody had their teeth extracted and had dentures put in. Uh, that was mainly because we didn't know why your teeth would get loose and have to be removed. Well, that was because of periodontal problems or gum tissue problems, and now we know that. That's why we recommend people brush their teeth. Um, if they brush their teeth and do an adequate job 
of removing the bacteria and the food particles and the plaque around the teeth, you can pretty well prevent periodontal problems from setting in. And if you prevent that, then you can keep your teeth to an older age, whereas years ago we didn't know that people had periodontal problems, had to have their teeth extracted and dentures put in. If you have a denture, uh, if you have just an upper denture, you know that an upper denture stays in relatively well. Um, the lower dentures, whenever I'm going to make a lower denture for someone, I tell them, that, now your lower denture is going to stay in about as well as ice skates work, or roller skates work on ice. They don't work. Lower dentures do not stay in place well for a long period of time. The reason is that the bone underneath, which holds your dentures in, gradually is destroyed from the pressure that is put on it from chewing. Um, it used to be that we didn't really have any solution to that problem, but nowadays we can put implants in and use the implants to support the pressure uh, of the chewing so it preserves the bone height and it also keeps the dentures in place so that they don't move around. Now an upper denture stays in place relatively well because you have a much larger amount of bone on the roof of your mouth and that bone has tight fitting tissue on it um, that doesn't move. If you feel up to the roof of your mouth and push on it with your tongue the tissue doesn't move, it doesn't give, it's very tight against the bone. That tight fit allows the dentist to, when he takes an impression to make you a denture, it allows for a very tight fit uh, of the denture up against hard tissue. And when you have that, all you need is a little saliva uh, in there to hold a well-fitting denture in place because the it's similar to putting a drop of water between two pieces of glass and trying to pull one piece off. It's not going to happen. You have to twist it and slide it off. So if you have an adequate representation of the tissue in the impression that the denture takes, an upper denture usually stays in place fairly well. Now, if it's been years since it's been relined, it may need to be relined by the dentist. A lot of people, unfortunately, think once their teeth are all gone, they never have to go to the dentist again. Um, but uh, it's important to go in not only to see if the denture needs to be relined so that it fits better, but to have your mouth checked for oral cancers. Oral cancers are fairly common. Um, and the only one who's going to look in your mouth to find them is going to be a dentist. <laughs> the, the physician might say, ah, and that's it, you know. Uh, he's looking at your tonsils and your throat, he's not necessarily looking around the rest of your mouth. Uh, so it's important, even if you don't have uh, any teeth left, to go in and see a denture or a dentist on a regular basis so he can evaluate the quality of your denture and the quality of your tissues. One of the other things that happens as you age is your tissue tends to get thinner and thinner. Uh, you can see that if you just look at your hand. Uh, sometimes you can see uh, blood vessels and tendons and ligaments that you never used to be able to see. Um, and in your mouth that happens also. Uh, the dentist can, when he looks in the mouth, can, the tissue gets thinner and thinner. As the tissue gets thinner and thinner, it becomes more susceptible to denture sores, things like that. So having your denture stabilized with implants is uh, really nice, uh, especially the lower one. Uh, the upper one, like I say, it generally stays in relatively well. If it is has a, if the dentist had a good impression and the lab made a good quality denture for you, the upper one stays in fairly well. It's not the case with the lower one. The lower one gradually gets worse and worse as the bone is worn away, and as it gets worse and worse, you'll have more and more problems. You'll have more and more sore spots. Um, you'll 
And as the tissue gets thinner, those sore spots become more irritating because the tissue will be torn uh, rather than just irritating. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, you've been talking about implants, because it's only been in the last, I don't know, five years or so, ten years that I've really seen commercials about them and heard about them. What, what exactly are they? How do they work? Implants are, there, there's a lot of different brands and kinds out there, but if we want to divide implants into two groups, you have a standard form implant and then you have what we call a mini implant. Um, the minis are generally what are used to stabilize uh, dentures uh, because the teeth have been gone for a while and as the teeth are gone the bone shrinks and gets smaller and smaller and the minis will stay in that smaller amount of bone whereas a regular implant needs a more bone volume to put them in. But if you look at them, the minis look basically like a screw. Um, and they can actually be put in just like a screw, um, right through the tissue. Uh, they just can be screwed right into the bone itself through the tissue. Um, and the, all of the implants are either a pure titanium or a um, titanium with a coating on the outside that uh, tends to promote bone growth to the titanium. Um, and the bone growth to the implant is what stabilizes it. Now a regular implant looks more like a bolt, a small bolt. Um, and quite often they will have a, a flat or flatter end on them rather than a point like the minis do. Uh, they are not designed to be screwed right into the bone without preparing the bone. Uh, with a regular implant you have to either lay a flap or use a cookie cutter approach where you uh, take a small circular section of the gum tissue away and then you have to drill through the bone with varying sizes of drills uh, till you you're, get... You're asleep while this happens, right? <laughs> uh, no. Actually, implants are uh, no, you're awake surprisingly, <laughs> um, I won't say painless, but they, they surprised me. When I first started putting implants in, um, and some of my first implants, as you, Mickey McMurray, well, uh, Neil McMurray was one of my first implant patients years ago. Um, I think I, I don't know exactly how many years I've been placing them because to me that's not important. Um, but I've been placing them oh, probably about 15 years, longer than anyone who is still in town. Uh, the only people who were placing implants longer than I were several of the oral surgeons who have retired. But, um, For someone who needs them, can you put 32 implants in, or how does that work? You can. As a general rule, dentists never replace third molars. Um, and a, a normal individual has a set of 32 teeth if they have all of their wisdom teeth, which are the third molars. But if we are putting implants in someone, we would seldom put more than 28 in. Um, unless somebody just has a huge mouth and has plenty of room for third molars, we never replace hmm. third molars. So the most you'd be looking at would be 28. Neil had uh, about 20, I believe, uh, when he passed away in his mouth. Um, but implants are uh, fairly expensive, full-sized regular implants are much more expensive than the minis. The minis because they're relatively quick and easy to put in, uh, are in my office are about one fourth the cost of a regular of regular implant for placement. Uh, by the time you're done, they're uh, even more economical than that because on a regular implant you usually put a crown on it, 
uh, which adds another thousand dollars or so to your cost. Um, whereas if you're using a mini, you just the mini that holds a denture in just has a usually has a ball on the end of the of the implant, and you use a little attachment that just goes over and slides over that ball and kind of holds your denture in place. That attachment is drastically less than the cost of a crown. So uh, the, the minis are considerably less expensive and, and that's good because it makes it not that expensive for someone to stabilize a denture. Mm -hmm. uh, now implants, the, the type of implants we use now have been really around since about 1968. <coughs> the brand that I use has, was, uh, came out in 1981. So it is one of the older implants on the market. Um, but the previous implants before then tended to be blade vent implants, um, subperiosteal implants. Um, most of those, I remember the first course that I took on implants, and the, that was back in the late 70s, and the dentist at that time said, your patients will love these because they will stabilize their denture. And then he said, but every single one of them will eventually have problems. Are the implants then similar to the root canals? Uh, implants and root canals are totally different. Totally different? Yeah. A root canal is done on a, on a natural tube. And basically, with a root canal, you remove the nerve from the inside of the tooth, or the dead nerve is usually the case, because most of the time we're only doing root canals on a tooth that is already dead. And so you clean out the dead material from inside the tooth, you sterilize it or disinfect it, and then you fill that space up down inside the, the root and the, and the middle portion of the tooth with a material that keeps bacteria from getting in there again. And by doing that, you allow the individual to keep that tooth as a functional tooth in their mouth. Whereas if you, uh, an implant cannot be put in if the tooth is still there. The tooth has to be removed for an implant to be put in. Now you can put an implant in immediately upon the removal of some teeth. You can put it, the dentist can put it in that at the same time he takes a tooth out. Uh, it is generally better to l allow the area to heal over and then put the implant in, but it can be placed immediately if, if necessary. For instance, if somebody gets in a fight and this tooth gets broken to the point that the dentist can't restore it and he's going to take out what's left, nobody wants to wait a month for the tissue to heal and four months for the bone to heal before they get that tooth back. So usually you take that tooth out, put the implant in right away, put a, uh, an abutment into the implant, and then put a crown on it, a temporary crown on it, that looks like your previous tooth. Um, are, are implants susceptible to decay and all, just like regular teeth? Or? Implants are not susceptible to decay because there's no living component of the implant. But implants are susceptible to periodontal problems just the way your own natural teeth are. So just because you went out and you got implants put in, you don't stop brushing your teeth and taking care of them. Because if you do, you can have a periodontal problem set in alongside of them. Um, the, a periodontal problem refers to a problem of the gum tissue the bone that supports that gum tissue and the ligament that supports a natural tooth. Now when you have a, an implant in, you don't have that ligament. Uh, the implant is uh, firmly attached to the bone, hopefully. The bone grows to the implant uh, and uh, supports that implant in its position. That's one of the differences between an implant and a natural tooth. A natural tooth if you grab a hold of one of your teeth and, and push on it, you can feel a slight amount of give. That slight amount of give is not the bone that's giving, it's the ligament that holds the tooth in the bone. 
and that allows it to, to move slightly. Well, that ligament serves as a shock absorber. Every time you bite on something, uh, it gives a little bit. It also tells you when your teeth are touching. If you tap your teeth together, that what you are feeling is the ligament telling you that I'm feeling a little pressure here. It's not the bone because the bone doesn't feel the pressure and it's not the tooth. It's the ligament that tells you that your teeth are touching. So when you bite on something and you and your teeth run into each other to keep you from biting harder, that ligament lets you know that, hey, your teeth are touching, you don't have to bite any harder, that sort of thing. Do you care for implants the same way you do regular teeth? Basically you do. Uh, you brush them, you floss around them. Um, the dentist, when you go into the dentist office, the hygienist will uh, remove any calculus that has formed on the implant. Um, and uh, it's important to, to maintain them just like you would a natural tooth. Uh, you want to brush them, you want to floss them, you want to get them checked every now and then. Because if there is a start of a periodontal problem around an implant, the dentist wants to jump right on that and, and treat that rather than allow it to get to an advanced stage because as I mentioned, the bone is what holds the implant in. The bone is what is destroyed in a periodontal problem, and if you destroy the bone that's holding that implant in, the implant will come out. The implant is not susceptible to decay, but it can still have a periodontal problem set in around it. The word periodontal means gum to me. It's not true, it's not the gums. When I hear the it's, word periodontal, I... Uh, Periodont periodontal refers to the tissues around the tooth. Okay, the first tissue uh, that holds the tooth in is the ligament that holds it into the bone. Underneath the gum tissue, the bone supports the tooth, and the gum tissue forms the gum tissue basically forms a bacterial seal around that tooth so that it prevents periodontal problems. But if for some reason that, that seal is broken down, then you start losing the bone, losing the gum tissue, losing the ligament that holds the tooth in. And that's why years ago, people used to have all their teeth taken out when they were 40 because they could grab them and wiggle them all over the place. Uh, because they didn't know they were supposed to brush their teeth to keep them healthy, and they hadn't. Some of them had never brushed their teeth in their life. Uh, so. That's most of what I wanted to uh, talk about. Now, you did have a question. I saw it uh, ooh, when I was talking about drilling holes into the bone. <laughs> but implants, uh, when I first started doing them, I thought, oh, this is going to hurt just as much as taking a tooth out does because I'm drilling holes in the bone here. <laughs> But I have had a surprising number of people who have had implants placed, who regular implants, not the minis. Uh, most of the minis, there's very little discomfort or any with those once they are in, in place. But a regular implant, you have to cut the tissue, you have to cut the bone, then you put the implant in. And uh, I was surprised with how some people would tell me, oh, it didn't bother me a bit, I didn't even take any pain medicine. And, uh, one of those. and Dan's one of those, one of those. <laughs> uh, which uh, surprised even me. Uh, I thought that they would be uh, as painful as having a tooth extracted, but that's not the case. You look like you have a question on that. Me? <laughs> Trying to speak the reason you say Dan, I'm just saying, the reason he didn't hurt is because Dan is brainless. <laughs> oh, 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 I resemble that. That's a tough crowd. <laughs> no question. Maybe, maybe I do have a question. Okay. And you're, so to do this to prevent the pain from happening, do you inject Novocaine or something? I do all of my implants with just local anesthetic. Local anesthetic. Yeah. Now, sometimes I have used nitrous oxide in addition to 
uh, implant, or in addition to the uh, local anesthetic. Um, that well, now the, the local anesthetic is that injected? That's injected. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's the shot that the dentist gotcha, gives you. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Nitrous oxide is a breathable gas that oh, it does not uh, stop you from feeling pain, but it makes it so that you don't really care for the most part. Laughing uh, gas. It's <laughs> what used to be referred to as laughing gas. And uh, uh, it doesn't really make you laugh. It just relaxes you to the point that some things might seem funny that didn't seem funny before. That sort of thing. Uh, but I placed basically all of my implants with uh, local anesthetic or a shot. Um, now talking about how um, implants don't hurt as much as you would think they would. I actually had a patient um, who, she was from England and the Europeans tend to have different concepts of pain than a lot of the Americans do. Um, their pain tolerances tend to be higher and the dentists over there tend to have different concepts also. <laughs> uh, quite often they will not use anesthetic at all for oh. fillings. Oh. Oh. Uh, oh. Oh. And yeah. now that, I know from personal experience that's not very comfortable, but uh, uh, my first dentist that I went to was a dentist in uh, Dendereed, Sweden, when my family lived in Sweden. And he didn't use any anesthetic, and, uh, uh, but um, that is not very common in the United States. But this one gal, she had all of her fillings done without any anesthetic. She had me extract teeth or take teeth out without any anesthetic. And she even had me place two implants without any anesthetic. She's one tough broad. Oh, yeah. One tough broad. Thank like you, Molly. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I would not recommend that to anyone, wow. but, uh, but she did it. And I, I mean, I'm sitting here just, oh, this has got to be hurting. This has got to be hurting, you know. And I, I told her, as I tell any patient who does not want a local anesthetic or a shot, uh, I don't. I can work on anybody without giving them a shot. Whether they can have me work on them mm -hmm. without a shot yeah. is the question. Of course. But I can always do the work without a shot. But if they are jumping and flinching around, oh, sure. I can't work on them. <laughs> oh, sure. And they're going to get a shot or they're going to have to go to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Because if I get in there with a high-speed handpiece, it can mm -hmm. cut right through the side of your mouth like that. <clears throat> There are arteries in your mouth that if I were to cut into them, you could bleed to death in my office. And mm -hmm. there isn't any way to stop it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do not work on somebody if they say, I don't want a shot, but then they're jumping all <laughs> over the place. No, nah, sorry, you're going you're gonna to have to go somewhere else or we're going to give you a shot. That's there all there is to it. Okay, now what do you do with people where their teeth don't fit together? Um, don't fit together it can be due to various things. Um, usually if they have their own teeth, uh, then they go to the orthodontist or we do, we do some orthodontics in my office and if it's not too big of a problem then we can handle it in my office. But um, uh, it can also be due to ankylose teeth where the the teeth did not, um, uh, the bone grew directly to the teeth and there was no ligament holding the tooth in the bone. And because of that, those teeth can stay far enough apart, you can stick your finger between them. Uh, and that person's teeth are closed, but they aren't touching. This, uh, this is where you got a, a longer bottom jaw than you do a top jaw, so you're treating them And together. in cases like that, um, generally, if they have their natural teeth, then basically you're talking about orthodontics and 
then a jaw surgery to correct that. Um, the orthodontist will line up the upper teeth, line up the lower teeth, and then you go in and the oral surgeon will break the jaw or fracture the jaw or cut it and then slide the jaw back uh, so that the teeth can get back into the position that they're supposed to be in. Uh, but if there's a, a discrepancy between how big the, the uh, maxilla or the what people refer to as the upper jaw and the lower jaw, if the upper jaw is way out too far, then they cut this, cut the mandible and slide it forward, and sometimes they will cut the upper and slide it back. Um, those are the ways that you can correct that problem. Now, if the problem is with a denture um, where they don't match up, then sometimes that just needs a, a new denture needs to be made. Uh, or the denture needs to be relined because as the longer your teeth are gone, the more the bone changes. And the teeth, your upper teeth, come in at an angle like this. When you take the teeth out, the bone still sticks out here like so. But as it changes, it goes like this. And so you lose some of the support you had for your upper lip and uh, the dentist needs to allow for that in the relining of the denture. That's so in essence, you should have had that done when you were a lot younger. Uh, when the surgery for natural yeah. teeth? Yeah. Yeah, usually you would want to have that done when you're younger. Most of the time, now it's done on, um, it, it's usually done after the individual reaches full bone maturity, which in the case of a gal is usually anywhere from 12 to 16 to 18 years of age, but for uh, a boy, quite often it's 18 to 28, because we all have heard of guys like um, uh, David Robinson who went to the Air Force Academy and uh, turned out to be too tall, or no, he went to the Naval Academy, mm -hmm. and he turned out to be too tall to serve in the Navy, but uh, because he grew so much after he went to college, um, and things like that do happen. So for boys, it's usually a later age, but uh, quite often adults tend to, it used to be that adults would not have had their teeth fixed, but they would have their children's teeth fixed. And quite often when the children were gone, then the mom or dad might come in and get the orthodontics done that they needed uh, because they saw the changes in their children and, man, I should have had that done when I was younger and now that the kids are gone, I've got the money, I'm going to go in and get it done. So it can be done at a later age, um, but you're usually, for the most part, you aren't going to do the, the jaw surgery on someone who um, is much over 60 years of age, uh, because it's a fairly traumatic surgery, um, and can be hard on somebody that's too old. Um, so yeah, it probably should have been done at a younger age. Any other questions? What do you do for periodontal disease? What do I do for periodontal disease? Yeah. Um, in my practice, um, I don't have as much periodontal problems in my practice as I used to. Um, part of that is because if you were to take all of my patients, and make a duplicate of them so that I had two of uh, two Dan Graces. We wouldn't want two. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Are you paying attention, Molly? Are you paying attention? Dan, But uh, if, if I had two of every one of my patients and I would go through my patients and evaluate them for periodontal problems. And the ones who have periodontal problems go over here and the ones who don't have periodontal problems go over here. And then I would take the second group, 
and all I would ask them is, do you smoke or have you recently quit smoking? The ones who smoke go over here, the ones who don't smoke go over here. Ninety-five percent of these groups are going to be the same. So if you don't smoke, your odds of having a periodontal problem are very small. Okay, You can still have them. If you don't brush your teeth well, if your saliva isn't fluid enough, if, if your saliva is a real thick, heavy, ropey saliva, it holds the bacteria around your teeth. Um, and there isn't a whole lot we can do to change your saliva. That's what your cells produce. We can't change those cells. Um, but basically, like I say, if you don't smoke, you aren't going to have much of a periodontal problem. But you still can. There, like I say, there's about a 5% crossover that I see in my practice. But because of the recent trends to uh, eliminate smoking, tax it more and more, there are fewer and fewer people who do smoke, and as there are fewer and fewer people who smoke, I have fewer and fewer people who are What about those that chew? Pardon? What about those that chew? Chewing doesn't cause a periodontal problem. Uh, it, um, in some ways, chewing stimulates saliva flow. We've already talked about that. If you increase your saliva flow, you're less apt to have decay. Chewing also physically removes the bacteria from the teeth, so you're less apt to have cavities in a chewer. The thing you are more apt to have is oral cancers, because you have the same uh, noxious chemicals in the tobacco, whether you're smoking it or whether you're chewing it. Okay? So you're more apt to have oral cancers, and you need to, anybody who chews needs to go into the dentist on a regular basis and have their gum tissue checked to see if they've got any cancerous changes that have showed up. Any other questions? Any, anything anybody would like to ask about? Hmm? Talk about pain. You look like you're thinking. Well, I'm, I'm kind of confused because I must be really different then because I've had periodontal disease since I was eight. When I was eight, my teeth were all loose, my gums were swollen, I couldn't eat anything for a couple of weeks, I had to just drink through a straw. They said I had periodontal disease. Then as an adult, and I always brushed my teeth, I've never been a smoker, and, and then here in Casper I was sent to an oral surgeon, I cut the gums away, I was supposed to be okay. Then I went you to went to a periodontist as opposed to an oral surgeon, I believe. Probably for the well, surgery. The dentist sent me to someone for surgery. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that would have been a periodontist. Okay. Yeah. And then another dentist told me it doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to get rid of it. It just, he says, I have it. I've had it all my life. I have fought this. I mean, I brush my teeth two to three times a day. I, um, I use an electric toothbrush. I use a water pick. I do everything to save my you teeth. You do everything right. Yeah. I do. And you can still have some problems. And I Periodontal do. disease is a, uh, it's what we call an episodic disease. If you were to look at everyone in this room and look at their mouth, somewhere in their mouth, I would probably be able to find some signs of a periodontal problem. Uh, the signs that you want to look out for is if you brush your teeth and the gums are bleeding. Okay, that's number one. If you push on the side of a tooth and you get pus, that's pretty bad also. Okay, um, but a lot of uh, a lot of periodon periodontal problems can be massively overdiagnosed by some dentists. Um, basically, if you do a, a probing of that individual's mouth and you don't find any pockets over three millimeters, a three millimeter pocket can be maintained by an individual with a toothbrush if they do a good job. If they do a good job. Okay. Um, anything over three millimeters 
is an indicator of periodontal problems starting to set in. Four to five millimeters may be uh, correctable just by having your teeth cleaned and maybe going on a antibiotic to help cut down on the the inflammation in the gum tissue. Sometimes a four millimeter pocket is really only a three millimeter pocket that's a little swollen or a two millimeter pocket that's a little swollen. The same can be said for a five. But once you get over about a five millimeter pocket then you're really starting to get into a periodontal problem. What we do for periodontal problems in my office is I will do scaling and root planing on them Scaling and root planing is deeper than a normal cleaning. Uh, normal cleaning is up to that three millimeters, basically. But once you go past there, then you get down on root surfaces of the teeth, and the root surfaces have nerve endings that go to the outside of them. So if you start scraping on those root surfaces, it's going to be uncomfortable. So usually for scaling and root planing, we give anesthetic, local anesthetic again, uh, so that it doesn't hurt and we will do a section of the mouth at a time uh, and once we have done scaling and root planing then we usually put them on an antibiotic and allow them to heal and then we check and make sure they're healing and how they're healing up um, if your pocketing is um, resistant to the treatment that I have and I can't get you to where you have no pockets that are um, three millimeters or less or all your pockets and, and you still have some sixes, sevens, tens, then we would recommend that you go to the periodontist to have the surgery that you had, which is not a whole lot of fun. And in fact, it's got a pretty bad name. A lot of uh, the time, most of the time, when I recommend that to one of my patients, they will say, no, I don't want to do that. I would rather just keep them as best, as clean as I can, and then when they have to be lost, lose it. And that's their decision. I don't make the decisions on their treatment. They make the decisions on their treatment. I tell them what we can do and it's up to them to decide what we are going to do. And periodontal surgery is pretty uncomfortable, as I'm sure you found out. Yes, and not only that, but now all my roots are exposed. Yeah, and, and you do have those root surface exposures, and then you're more prone to decay, so then you have to brush even better than you did before. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the problems that people can have when they have their own teeth is proper brushing technique. A lot of people brush the top of their teeth and you really don't need to brush the chewing surfaces of your teeth. Um, especially most of us have already had fillings put in there and so those are fillings. They aren't, fillings cannot decay. Now you can get decay in the tooth around the filling but the filling itself cannot decay. But where you need to brush is the gum tissue, where the gum tissue and the tooth meet. And uh, what we mean by a pocket, if, you, if this is your tooth, the gum tissue comes up alongside of it and then it curls and it attaches to the tooth down lower than the height of the gum tissue. And we measure this height from here to here when we do on all of our patients for a checkup. You know that. Mm -hmm and uh, we measure that and we see how deep that pocketing is. A lot of people who had periodontal problems got those problems because their dentist didn't do a periodontal screening very often. And maybe they didn't do it for a long time. Now the problem you had when you were eight, that's unusual. Um, but you can have some juvenile periodontal problems. Um, but the periodontal problem is caused by bacteria and if you have it as a juvenile it's usually a different bacteria that causes that problem than as an adult but it's not one single bacteria that's why as we were talking earlier they've been trying to develop 
um, vaccines against periodontal problems. Problem is, there's 15, 20 different bacteria that can cause a periodontal problem. Mm -hmm. And so you don't need one vaccine, you need 15 or 20 of them. And, and you might vaccinate them for 20, and then here's a 21st one that causes it. You know, it's, it's, uh, so there is no successful vaccine uh, against either cavities or um, periodontal problems. That doesn't mean they aren't working at them. And uh, uh, in fact, they work on them routinely, and there's always stuff in my literature about how close they're getting and things like this. I have one other question. What kind of toothpaste do you recommend? Because the dentist told me that Crest now has sand in it, and that's what... Has what? Sand. Sand. Sand? Sand in Crest. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's one party. All, um, Hi. A lot of toothpaste um, okay. have a um, an abrasive of some sort mm -hmm. in them that are used to help clean the teeth. Right. Um, none of them have sand <laughs> in them. Okay. Okay. Help you get your minerals. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> now, the the dentist uses when you go into the dentist office, the hygienist will use a uh, pumice paste uh, on your teeth. Feels like rocks. And and it kind of feels like sand. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah like that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but pumice is the softest rock we know of. Basically, mm -hmm. uh, it'll even float on water. If you put a piece of pumice in water, it'll actually float. Um, and uh, and the hygienist basically keeps that only on the enamel and uses it to remove the stains that people get on the enamel from coffee, tea, soy sauce, various other things. Do you recommend the ones that have peroxide in them to whiten your teeth? Um, Whitening teeth uh, is best done with a custom tray that a dentist can make that fits your teeth individually. Um, a whitening toothpaste generally is not going to be in your mouth long enough to do a whitening job. Um, now, whitening toothpaste.